talk about a homological algebra for persistence modules. It's a project I did for my thesis work uh, with Peter Bubinik at the University of Florida. And uh, uh, so just a quick reminder of what persistence modules are. Typically in topological data analysis, we have this situation where we have some increasing sequence of topological spaces and inclusion maps between them. And we would like to measure some uh, shape features uh, from this data. So typically that's going to be homology with coefficients in some field. And these inclusion maps will induce some uh, linear maps between the corresponding vector spaces that are produced by the homology. Uh, and we actually keep track when certain features are born and when they die. So for example, here in this picture, you see that there is a single connected component born at time A, and then at time B, there's another one. So we record that with this red uh, diagram, uh, or we call it barcode. Uh, and then at time C, another one is born. But then at time D, uh, the first two get connected. So uh, we say that the second one, uh, the second feature died at that time. And then eventually we might get some actually one dimensional holes or so cycles. So at time F, we get this triangle. And then at time G, it's also filled in, so it dies. So this is how you like to keep track of this information. And I was interested in uh, these objects, these barcodes, uh, which we call them persistence modules. And they have a very rich algebraic structure. So depending from what, what your algebra background is, there are several uh, canonical equivalent ways to think about these objects. You can think of them as either query representations over the real numbers, or you can think of them as functors from the real numbers into vector spaces. You can think of them as graded modules over the real numbers, uh, or you can think of them as sheaves and co-sheaves. And these are, they have a very rich algebraic structure, which means that they're nice. So just like uh, finitely generated modules over a principal ideal domain, uh, you can, there is a structure theorem that means that you can split them into this composition uniquely. So you should think of the infinite bar, this red one as the free part and all these finite bars as the torsion parts. Uh, and the, the project that motivated me to start this, uh, to looking into this was uh, we have this Kunitz theorem in algebraic topology, which means that when you have two topological spaces, and you take your product space, you can recover the homology of the product space with some, uh, as some combination of the homologies of the underlying spaces you had to begin with. Uh, so for example, here we have these two triangles, their product is going to be this square, or if you like a torus, um, when you identify the points. And uh, the question is, okay, if I have some filtrations on the triangle, so I can compute the persistence modules, uh, what is the filtration I need to put on this torus so that I can recover, so I can compute the persistence module of this filtration on the torus uh, in terms of the other two filtrations I had from the triangles. So what is the filtration value I need to put on this uh, two cell? What is the filtration value I need to put on this one cell? What is the filtration value on the vertices? And to do this, we need some notion of a tensor product between these objects. We need some tensor products of persistence modules. And there are two canonical ones. And I would, uh, th these are the definitions for arbitrary persistence modules, but I would just focus on this example where you have two small intervals. Um, so the first one comes from graded module theory, and it's supposed to account for the different degrees of the generators and how, uh, and the torsion of the corresponding modules you have. So for example, here you have a single generator born at time A and a single generator born at time C. So in the tensor product, there's going to be a single generator born at the time A plus C. And how long will this generator live? Well, it's going to be the minimum of the two torsions. So this, this interval has some length. This interval has some length. The length of this interval will just be the minimum of those two lengths. So that's what the min in the formula means. And uh, there is also a tensor product coming from sheaf theory. Uh, and it, you just intersect the corresponding intervals. It's, it's that simple. So uh, we also need to compute uh, the right functors for these uh, operations uh, to get the Kunet theorem. And those are pretty straightforward computations as well. Uh, so suppose you have this interval module AB and you can construct its free resolution. Okay, these are free modules. Uh, and then you, tensor with, uh, the, the, then you tensor the sequence with uh, the interval CD uh, and you only care about the red and blue interval tensor products, and you're trying to compute uh, the kernel of this map. Uh, so what, what is the kernel of this map from the blue interval to the red one? 
Well, there's two cases to consider. Either the blue and the red one will overlap like this, uh, or they will not overlap like this. In this case, the kernel is the whole thing. And in the other case, the kernel is uh, from here to here. Okay, so you can compute the tor, tor functor like that. Uh, so now that we have all these examples and we computed all these formulas, we can state the theorems. Um, so for, for the two different tensor products, you have two different Kuhnet theorems. Uh, and these statements are pretty very technical, but let me just come back to the tourist example. What this means for us is if you, uh, there's two canonical choices for a filtration function on the torus, basically. If you want to compute the persistence module of that filtration function uh, in terms of the per, uh, persistence modules of the underlying uh, spaces, you can either put the additive filtration. So for example, this two cell was produced by this edge and this edge, so the value you're going to put there is just the sum of the two values that you had. And you do that for uh, every single edge and every single uh, vertex that you got as a product of some lower dimensional things. Or if you want to use the sheaf tensor product, you need to put the maximum value. You need to use the maximum filtration. So it's the same thing. You This edge has the filtration value E1. The other one had E2. So you take the max of the two to get the filtration value of this two cell. And some other things you can do uh, is you can also look at universal coefficients theorems. And uh, these are just uh, these are just Kuhnet theorems, except uh, the second thing that you have is not a chain complex, but it's just a, it's a simple module that you think of it as a chain complex concentrated in degree zero. Um, so let's look at the first example I had on my slides. We have this filtration of a triangle. Uh, and I want to produce a chain complex of persistence modules from this filtration. So how am I going to construct that? Well, I want to construct uh, the complex in degree zero just to be generated by all the free modules corresponding to the times when the vertices appeared. So for example, I have a vertex appearing at time A, another vertex appearing at time B, and another one appearing at time C. So that's how I get this uh, complex in degree zero. And then I do, if I go up in dimension, I do the same thing for the edges when they appear. And I do the same thing for the two cells. So there's a single two cell appearing at time G. And what are the boundary maps between these complexes? Well, they're just going to be induced by the boundary maps that you have on the triangle, uh, pretty straightforward. And it's no surprise that the way we constructed these, that once you compute the homology of this complex, you actually just get back the persistence module we had at the beginning. Now, suppose you, you change coefficients. So suppose you tensor this complex by some other module, let's say this one, for example, negative infinity to zero. Uh, then uh, according to the formulas I had in the previous slide, your complex changes like this. And you might be wondering, okay, what's the homology of this complex? Well, that's why we have the Kuhnet theorem. So we can just use the Kuhnet theorem to compute it. And we get that it's equal to this. And on the next uh, picture, it looks like this. Uh, so effectively what we've done by tensoring with this, um, it was negative infinity to zero, but you can generalize it to any alpha, is we kind of flipped the filtration. Uh, so we had the whole triangle was present at negative infinity, so it was born before time. And then we started deleting vertices and edges. And you might be uh, confused because at the beginning we had this increasing sequence of uh, spaces and we had inclusion maps. But now I have these arrows, but they're, they're no longer inclusion maps. But if you go the other way, you see that you do have inclusion maps. So um, this is not, I don't have a complete theory for this, but what this appears to be computing is cohomology uh, because uh, cohomology will induce maps going the other way. Uh, and if you actually compute these uh, for this example, uh, you can maybe see, uh, if, if you play up with some algebraic topology, you'll see that these cohomology groups are just uh, the, co the compactly supported cohomology uh, of the spaces, which just corresponds to the cohomology of the one-point compactification. So you can just compactify each of these spaces and see what the corresponding cohomology should be. That's how you can see it. And finally, I just wanted to give some references for this work, just uh, these two papers. And that will be all. Thank you for listening.